Okay, this year, an openly transgender athlete will complete, uh, compete, excuse me, complete, compete and complete at the Olympics for the first time, but eight states in the United States have passed laws targeting trans athletes' inclusion in sports. We've got someone wonderful here today. Here to discuss the impact of these laws is two-time Masters Track Cycling World Champion, Dr. Veronica Ivey, who is, who is herself a transgender athlete and activist. Dr. Ivey, it's great to see you. We've had a whole slew of discussions today um, on, on every, as many of the dimensions of the civil rights status of LGBTQ people in this country. And every year I do this, this is about, I don't know, the sixth or seventh time we've had an annual summit looking at these rights. I sort of feel like, um, as I mentioned ago, that there's a bit of whiplash sometimes. We've made you know, progress on transgender service in the military, you know, transgender rights in various other ways, and then we see it kind of ripped, ripped back. And I always thought it would be hard to take rights back. Now I have been convinced that it's not. Can you give us, we've, now what's exploded is the question of transgendered athletes competing in sports and, and states taking actions to, to try to stop um, our transgendered uh, uh, brother and sister from doing this. So I would, I would ask you to give our audience an understanding of the state of play right now and what should they most be concerned about? Yeah, so you're asking me like, how did we get here? And um, there is currently an all out culture war against specifically trans people and more specifically trans feminine people. And Largely, I think we got here because they failed on their bathroom bill efforts, failing to ban trans women, specifically from women's bathrooms and change rooms, and how terribly North Carolina's HB2 went, that a lot of the same groups that were behind those culture war efforts saw the failure and then saw sport as another vehicle for the same types of efforts, but they don't actually care about women's sport at all. Mm. Um, a lot of the people, I mean, like Donald Trump Jr. has hate tweeted about me ruining women's sport, for example, and I seriously doubt that he knew that Masters women's track cycling was even a thing. So we're here just because they view it as a more likely avenue to continue their attempts to exclude trans people from society more generally. So this combines with those efforts to ban access for trans children, teens, adults for gender affirming care, and then even allowing medical practitioners to deny us care altogether. All of this is of a piece. It's a package of discrimination, I know. When, when a Donald Trump Jr. attacked you, did you find <laughs> Anyone surprising come out of the woodwork to give you support? Um, no, um, I, I actually didn't know what had happened. I suddenly got a, a lot of hate email. Mm. And usually when that happens, that signals to me that something big-ish has happened in the alt-right world. And um, usually it's like a, a Breitbart article or something like that. And um, I found the tweet hilarious. I actually printed it out and put it on my office door in color. Um, so, you know, I think in the current online, like Twitterverse, unfortunately, there are a lot of very vocally angry and it's, they're not that many but pe people are their worst selves online and so people are very scared often to voice their support um but certainly like i it was water off my back um i thought it was i thought it was hilarious he's an idiot um you know veronica when uh i looked in this and i i hope this is correct and my understanding is the NCAA supports transgender participation in sports and the International Olympic Committee um, allows trans athletes since 2003 and also in 2016 that gender confirmation surgeries were not necessary to compete. I guess my question to you is what has changed and are, are those not important benchmarks that just sort of solidify this and, and protect this from this kind of temporary political blip? Um, or am well, I missing something? Well, no, nothing protects us from the political whims because mm. this is how the U.S. legal system is set up, mm. that trans, like gender identity is not a protected 
characteristic. Um, it is in terms of like the Bostock Supreme Court decision that has to do with Title VII. Um, we need it to be extended to Title IX, but it needs to be an enshrined human right uh, to not discriminate against trans people for being trans. And the thing with sport in particular is, like you said, the International Olympic Committee, whom I have advised on their trans policies, have allowed trans people to compete since the 2004 Athens Olympics. And since then, we have had over 54,000 Olympians without a single Olymp Olympian even qualifying who is trans. This year, we're going to have at least two. There might be three. Um, and the NCAA has had their policy for about 10 years now, and they've had over a million athletes, and there hasn't been a single Division I national champion who's trans. The only national champion who's trans uh, was a Division II athlete, Cece Telfer, and she just won that in the last year before COVID. So if there were going to be this explosion of trans women athletes taking over, it would have already happened. So it's non-science-based scaremongering, and they continue to forget about the existence of trans men athletes. And so the policies they are producing will reproduce cases like Mac Beggs being forced to compete against girls as a trans boy in high school wrestling. And people forget that the most commercially successful trans athlete is a trans male athlete who has represented the U.S. national team twice, it's Chris Mosier. So mm. people always forget that trans male athletes exist. They always hyper-focus on trans girls. So I want to tell our audience um, that Dr. Veronica Ivey is an interdisciplinary scholar and professor publishing on these issues, advising groups, you know, trans and intersex athletes. I mean, you're a scholar and an intellectual that has looked at science and has said this. I think it is a, uh, also a reality that one of the elements of the politics of this is the fear mongering goes into communities with people that are not studied in the science, that do not have you know, your grounding uh, in providing this. So when you go into those communities and you're trying to generate an understanding of the issues of people who don't know and they're led down a path and said, hey, you know, these were men, now women, it's unfair, et cetera. Can you please give um, the scaffolding of the argument so that those that don't have it, and even those people who are watching, we am sure many people watching today um, are, are, are see the importance of pride, they see the importance of this, and they themselves may not know the language and the scaffolding to share with others. So if you could give us a synopsis of that, I think it would be really constructive. Sure. So the very first thing is that the International Olympic Committee really sets the stage for most sports around the world, whether they are Olympic sports or not. Um, they set the bar. And in their Olympic charter, they have seven fundamental principles of Olympism. And the fourth principle begins, participation in sport is a human right. And so they really do mean that. And so they, as an institution, as an organization at the most elite level of sport, have recognized for almost 20 years now that trans athletes should compete in the gender that they are. So trans women should compete in women's sport, trans men should compete in men's sport. For them, they have uh, relaxed their policies over years. So the 2015 policy that you referenced that went into effect for 2016, removed the gender uh, genital surgery component and installed just the 12 month testosterone policy. My research uh, it involves that even the testosterone requirement is unnecessary to ensure fairness in sport. So the framing, the misframing, I think is more important that people are comparing like male averages and world records to female averages and world records and they're treating trans girls and trans women as men instead of trans women so the data that we should be looking at is how do trans women compare to cis women not how do men compare to women right and so the entire scientific debate that 
uh, people who oppose trans inclusion in sport, they are leaning on just men and women. They're not making the distinction between trans and cis, which is where we should be focused. And as it turns out, we didn't study this for decades because we just assumed it be, to be true, but your unaltered internal levels of testosterone have no relationship to your performance. So if you add testosterone more than your body is used to, your performance tends to go up, which is why we, we ban that for doping. Mm. And if you drop it below what it's used to, your performance will tend to go down, which is what happens for most trans athletes when they transition from, from male towards female. Um, however, there is a huge range within a sex. So a male at the world elite level can be competing with natural testosterone below the women's average against another male with 50 times as much natural testosterone with no relationship to performance. So the focus on testosterone is completely misplaced scientifically. Well, listen, I, I just want to tell, I, I love this tweet that you said, newsflash Trump Jr., I'm a woman, says transgender cyclist Dr. Veronica Ivey. I love your tweets, and I just, um, and, and, and uh, you're, you're saying sports is a human right. Thank you so much, Veronica Ivey, Masters Track Cycling World Champion, um, scholar, writer on these issues. Let me just ask you real quickly, one last fast thing. Where can our audience go somewhere cool that you respect to learn more about this? Hmm. Um, <laughs> VeronicaIvy.com. I guess. <laughs> well, um, go to her Twitter so, feed. Go to Veronica's. Uh, go to Veronica's Twitter feed. There's an enormous amount of great linked yes. information and material yes. that comes from all over. I think this issue is going to be with us for a while, given what's gone on in states around the country. Um, I, I, I try. I think it's important. I just want to be able to direct our audience to important other um, informed. A uh, bit of opinion and, and, and research and science, as you said, on these issues. So, Veronica Ivy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.